Ever since I can remember, <clears throat> I have always been a sports fan. I don't remember a time actually when I did not enjoy playing, talking about, <clears throat> and uh, trading baseball cards. Uh, I had two cousins, we would come together, and uh, my older brother and I, and we would trade. We all had our favorite players, so we all knew who we needed to buy so that you could figure out how to get who you wanted because you had the one they wanted, and so we learned how to broker deals. And uh, <clears throat> sports have been a big part of my life uh, growing up. I've been privileged to be a part of some historic moments in sports. <clears throat> On April the 4th, 2001, I happened to have the ticket stub. I was getting something out of the attic before I, uh, for Reed's birthday party, and I remembered this stub was still in a box, and so I pulled it. But uh, in a on April the 4th, 2001, I was on a school trip <clears throat> to Washington, D.C. And uh, that night we went to Camden Yards to watch the Orioles play the Red Sox. And I remember sitting, we didn't ever go to our seats, we sat near the bullpen and watched Tadeo Nomo <clears throat> warm up. And uh, Veritek was his catcher and we were watching him. And um, that was the first night that there was ever a no-hitter thrown in Camden Yards and uh, was watching him and you knew he was on his game when you were watching him warm up and it just continued to translate uh, throughout that particular game. <clears throat> uh, been privileged to be able to watch some of the, the best coaches in college history to coach the game. I've seen Calipari, I've seen Saban, seen all of those types of guys, uh, players. Obviously, uh, I've seen a lot of Ole Miss players. Eli Manning would blow your mind I know people like to make fun of him in some of the images and things and uh, the New York Jets, but I've seen him in live play need to fit a ball through a hole smaller than one of those rings you see, and he hit it. And, I mean, hands all around it, and it just zoomed straight through exactly where it needed to go. He was amazing to watch as a player. Or um, <clears throat> more commonly, D.K. Metcalf, who is a freak of nature, who uh, plays for the Seattle Seahawks. He is just a monster specimen of a human being. And let me tell you something, when you see him in person, he's every bit of that and more. He is absolutely phenomenal to watch play. And so uh, <clears throat> I've been able to see some of those guys the same way that so many of you have. Uh, but, <clears throat> you know, and as a kid, you, you're very enamored by the sheer size of these guys. You're, you're enamored by their abilities. And I still am. It, it's still amazing to watch their abilities at work. But for me, the thing that, as I've gotten older, that has gotten more amazing is understanding that what you see on the field is 1% of everything that has made them who they are. 99% is something that we will never see. When, they're, when, when everybody has gone home and they're still catching balls that are thrown to them, they're still taking shots, they're still taking batting practice, long after everybody else has gone home. There's a reason why when the time is right, they perform. It's because it's what they do all the time. And so uh, it has interested me to watch coaching dynamics and team building and things along that line. So I've always been one uh, who's enjoyed sports. Now, <clears throat> sports, knowing exactly the history of when sports began and the history of the world is not exactly the easiest thing to ascertain, but it is quite old. Um, some of the, the lack of being able to prove it is simply the lack of documents. We just don't have the documentation of it, but we have things very early that prove that sports existed. And the New Testament is filled with sports references and sports words that are used. Now, you don't see them in English, but when you look at them in the original language, you can see quite clearly that this is an athletic image that's being used. Uh, obviously, the most common one, I think, in the New Testament is the image of the runner. Um, you see that in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 2, Galatians 5, 7, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, 2 Timothy uh, 2 and verse 5, 2 Timothy 4, verse 7, um, a lot of those things. Another image that's not as well known, when Paul says concerning the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 32, he says, what do I gain if humanly speaking I fought with beasts at Ephesus? You see, that because the fighting of a beast was an Olympic game. It was a, something that was involved in their coliseum and their amphitheaters. It was the, they had animals that would fight each other, but they also had contests where an individual, they would stage the open arena and let loose a wild animal, and they would stage the hunting of that particular wild animal. And it seems as if Paul is making a play on that particular image when he writes 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 32. 
um, <clears throat> and, and a number of different things hopefully that we can draw out. But what I want us to do tonight is to go to one text in particular that really encompasses a lot of this sports imagery and see what it is that he's saying as he looks to them uh, for an example in Christianity. <clears throat> so 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 to 27. He says this, Do you not know that in a race all the runners r run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly, and I do not box as one beating the air. But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. And so what he has reference to in this particular context are most likely, which is we'll talk more about in just a second, the Isthmusian Games. Okay? There were major games that were played throughout Greece, four of them, and they're all pretty centrally located. And uh, Corinth was the host city of the Isthmusian Games. And so he takes that image from sports and he translates that into Christianity. That you see some things that they're doing. You remember even Jesus said in one of the most, for some people it's been a very troublesome parable. It's not really all that troublesome if you really take a look at it. But the unjust steward, you remember because he's going to lose his job and he goes and he cuts accounts, cuts deals with the, the individuals who have accounts with his master who has fired him. And the point that Jesus is making is not, he's not endorsing unjust business practices. What he's endorsing is that this person planned for his future. And that as Christians, you have to plan for your future. You have to plan for eternity. You have to have a mind that looks further than just the direct present. And so many times we'll see these images come to the forefront. So tonight I want us to do <clears throat> just three things together. First of all, look at a history and kind of get an idea of what's going on in these games, and there are a lot of things that could be said about them, but we'll try and keep it uh, condensed so that we can just get somewhat of an understanding. Then I want us to look <clears throat> at this comparison in 1 Corinthians 9 and see the imagery that he draws upon, and then close with a couple of points of application. So first of all, let's begin with the history of these particular games. As we said, there were four particular locations. Now, obviously, the oldest was the Olympiad. Uh, obviously what we now call the Olympics. Uh, the Olympiad was held every four years in honor of Zeus. It is believed to have started in roughly the 8th century BC, but historical sources seem to give us the idea that that's when we have it documented they started, but the sources that we have that document it starting in the 8th century BC, see, they seem to tell us that they restarted. And so the implication is that they had gone on many years before that and had stopped, and now they're restarting. And so <clears throat> you have those. They lasted for over 1,000 years and hosted 293 games. Then you have what were known as the Nemean Games. And these are all based out of cities. This was also in honor of Zeus, held every two years. And then you had the Isthmusian Games, which is, I think, the games under discussion in 1 Corinthians 9, in honor of Poseidon, the god of the sea. Now... It was held every two years as well. All of these games were strategically located and, and timed so that they did not contradict one another. They did not have games running simultaneously uh, because they were very important. It was in, uh, as we said, on the north side of the city, and during the first century, they were housed in tents. The contestants were housed in tents. Later on, second century uh, A.D., they began to erect structures, and so they had more permanent dwellings. But here's the thing to consider. What was Paul's occupation? He was a tent maker. So it's likely that one of the ways that he supported himself in preaching the gospel was that he sold some of his tents for some of these isthmus and games. And so he was very familiar with that, having spent significant time in Corinth, and he uses that imagery here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 from that particular area. And then you had the Pythian games at Delphi. Delphi is most commonly remembered, especially in mythology, for the oracle at Delphi, uh, where people would seek... Uh, the guidance of the gods. <clears throat> and so those four major games, the Olympiad, of course, was the oldest, and then some of the others were added throughout the years. I think the Isthmus and games were about the 5th century or the 6th century B.C. All right. Number two, let's talk about the purpose of the games. Whereas our games today are basically entertainment-driven, uh, 
we kind of developed a new game and then we were just interested in it in those particular terms. Uh, their games were extremely religious. They were festivals in, honors, in honor of their gods. They were attached to their sanctuaries and their temples and uh, things along that line. So everything was centered around that particular focus. Also, you have to remember that Greece wasn't really a united nation. They were independent city-states. Okay? And so many times they would war with each other. It wasn't like the United States where you had different states and we all kind of get along. We have our differences, but we don't go to war with each other, except, well, obviously one glaring occasion. Um, <clears throat> but the Isthmus and Games were a way to keep those hostilities down. You get together, you participate in these events, and people get to know each other, and sometimes that's one of the things that leads to hostilities. We don't really know each other. We misrepresent things, and we misunderstand each other so they were used to help in that particular process Rome when they took over and they conquered the Greek Empire they used the games as a way to pacify the people they were worried about uprisings and so they said let's keep them busy and keep them entertained and so they used the games in that way to keep from uh, political insurrection <clears throat> now uh, number three the order of the games each of the games were either financed by the city or the state, the, the government, or a wealthy patron, and sometimes both, because it was pretty expensive to be able to have them. Uh, they would go through a rigorous training process, especially for that time. Uh, they would go through a 10-month training process leading up to the games. They would swear an oath that they would not sin against the Olympiad, that they would not cheat and break the rules. And then, of course, they would go into and they would train in the gymnasium. Uh, the gymnasium has an interesting history. The word gymnasium itself is a word that literally means nude, naked. Okay? If you're looking for Bible authority, as I do, to stay away from a gym, that's it. Um, it's a place of naked people. Why would I want to go? Uh, but the gymnasium is a very, has an interesting history because the Greeks worship the human specimen. Okay? And so when Alexander the Great took over and united the city-states, he began to, as he began to conquer the rest of the world, take Hellenism, which was the Greek way of life, and transplant it into all these locations. And part of the way he did that was he had gymnasiums built so that they would learn the Greek way of life. And uh, it was very controversial, especially for individuals because they would exercise in the nude. And um, <clears throat> with that controversy, when he tried to bring it into Jewish locations, obviously it was met with very strong resistance. There is an occasion, there's a passage in the Deuterocanonicals or the Apocrypha, 2 Maccabees chapter 4, that discusses some of this intertestament history and the pushback that was received for trying to build a gymnasium in Jerusalem. The high priest actually got his position because he agreed to a deal uh, with the local Greek ruler that he would push a gym's construction uh, in the particular city. So, the gymnasium has uh, an important history and of course they would train there uh, then after they would uh, trained and gotten ready for the games, they would begin, they would start with the sacrifice to the gods. They would compete for the individual's right to be able to light that sacrifice at the very beginning of the games to commence it. Then they would have roughly three days of games. Some of them would spill over into uh, the last day, but the last day was usually the parade of victors and the major parties uh, that took place in the time. All right. Now as we think about the games themselves, the events, Obviously, running was a major event. Boxing was a major event. Um, they had another hybrid form of boxing that was similar to what we might consider to be UFC. Very, very, not very many rules involved. Uh, and far, far different than boxing or wrestling, which was also a different event as well. Uh, they had the pentathlon, <clears throat> so the penta five. And so the five events where people compete, compete today in like a triathlon or something along those lines, they had a pentathlon, the five. And the five um, games that they had in it were running, long jumping, the throwing of the discus, uh, the javelin, and wrestling. And so you could participate in those events as well. <clears throat> they were, in Greek time, they were uh, located in the stadiums. Okay, they, they had stadiums and we still have preserved in history uh, and in the location itself one of the original stadiums. Now the Greeks did not build stands, they didn't build coliseums, that was a Roman type invention. The Greeks just had their stadium and then they had open pastures around it where people could sit on the hills and watch. 
the Romans took that to a, to a much bigger uh, level <clears throat> when they built the Colosseum and, and some of the other locations. So, suffice it to say, it was an important part of their culture. Uh, it, it played a vital role in who they were. Now, <clears throat> let's move to the text of 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and see the comparison that he makes, and we'll see some of these particular images come out um, as we watch them go through. This text breaks into two sections. In verses 24 and 25, there's an exhortation that Paul gives, and then in verses 26 and 27, he uses himself as an example of what it takes to be able to serve Christ. So, number one under this idea of the exhortation, he encourages them to run. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. That in a race, in the English, that is the ESV renders it in a race. The Greek text literally reads in a stadium. In a stadion is the word. A stadion was actually became a unit of measurement. Okay? In the New Testament, uh, sometimes it will come out in more modern translations, but it will say he was so many stadia away. For an example, in uh, Revelation 14, 20, Revelation 21, 16 in the ESV, it talks about blood extending so many stadia, distance. It was 606 feet uh, was their particular stadia, and that's how they would measure things. And so those who run in a stadium, they do not all, only one of them receives a prize. This word translated prize, the Greek term, is the word from which we get the English word bravo, which was something they would cheer for the individual. It's not a word we use as much anymore, but it is a word that describes the accolades that are going on. And so we have bravo. Then the point that he's making with this text, though, is that not everyone receives the prize, but you must run that you may obtain it. And so his point is, is that you want the prize of eternal life, you have to run. You have to get into the race, okay? Everyone who runs, not everyone receives the prize, but they all must run. And so the point he's trying to emphasize to them, and this text is actually a transition text between 1 Corinthians 9 and 1 Corinthians 10, where he's been discussing forfeiting your rights and practicing some self-control and moving into a further discussion of that in chapter 10, He's watching that uh, unfold. And so he's telling them to get into the race. Then he says this, if you want to get into the race, you must be able to refuse some things. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. Okay? Now the word translated exercise here, we get the English word agony from. Okay? The English word agony or to agonize is the idea. That is, you have to be willing to go through the difficulties of saying no to certain things. Then he says, as he develops it even further, <clears throat> that you must exercise self-control. Literally, to have power over oneself, the ten months of training process. One ancient writer said this, when he was told by someone, I want to win the Olympics, his response was this, you must submit to discipline. Follow a strict diet, give up sweet cakes, train under compulsion at a fixed hour, in heat or in cold. You must not drink cold water nor wine just whenever you feel like it. You have to practice some self-control and discipline. Okay? You can't go on the whims of how you feel. So every athlete exercises self-control. That's the thing. Everybody, you know, the, the shallow view is you, that you look at an athlete's performance and you think, I want to do that. But you forget what it takes to be able to do that. Okay? Everybody wants to do it, but very few people can do it. Why? Because, well, to a large degree, a lot of people refuse to do the work to do it. Okay? Jerry Rice was, <clears throat> has been known to say that I will do today what others refuse to do so that I can do tomorrow what others cannot do. What was his point? I'm going to work hard today to, it, to develop this skill set so that tomorrow I can do things that they cannot do because they refuse to put in the work. And so the importance of this discipline 
that takes place. Now, the point he's making to the Christian is that you have to exercise self-control. That just because there are things we can do doesn't mean that there are things that we should do. And just because something may feel good and something may be easy in the moment doesn't mean that's the thing we need to be doing. You have to be willing to exercise self-control. And it is amazing to watch some of these athletes in their regiments and their self-control that they exhibit in what they refuse to eat and what they will make themselves eat and what they will make themselves do. Here's the thing. If we can understand that on an athletic field, Paul is saying we have to understand that in Christianity as well. In Christianity, there are things you have to say no to. In Christianity, you want to be spiritual? It's not going to be magical. You will no more wake up one day and be spiritual than a person can wake up one day and perform like the greatest rod receiver in the history of the world. That does not happen. He became the greatest wide receiver because, yes, partly because of his talent, but even more than that, because of his work ethic, because of his discipline. And so there are people that many times say, I want to be more spiritual. Well, here's the question. Are you willing to do the work that it takes? Because it's not magic. It's work. It's getting up and saying, you know what, I don't feel like reading my Bible today, but I'm doing it. Or I wake up on a Sunday morning and it might be easier for me to just say, you know what, I just won't be there today. But you get up and you go anyway. That's discipline. Discipline is what it takes and what you do when you don't feel like it. And that's what he's saying. We have to exercise discipline. But number three, he points them to the reward, and he's making a contrast between these rewards. He says, they do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Now, what they would receive in the early parts of the Isthmus and Games was a pine wreath. Uh, it was just a simple, you can research it, they changed, and, and the, the, what they were made of and, and the shape of them changed depending upon which games you were competing in, but they all received basically a, 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 a Stephanos is what it was called. <clears throat> it's not to be confused with the diadem. The diadem was something for royalty. The Stephanos was the victor's crown. And uh, in English, we don't see that in the translations, but uh, in the original, uh, the distinction is there. And so they would receive <clears throat> this withered... <laughs> By the time that Paul is writing in the early first century, they were receiving withered celery. The crown was made of withered celery. Now, do you see his point? They are willing to punish themselves and push themselves for a crown that has already withered. Isn't it amazing to see some people's commitment to athletics for something that will not last? We're not exercising control so that we can wear a nice wreath on our head that's already dead when we put it on. To bring it into a more modern translation, whatever you want to say, a medal around your neck. We're exercising self-control that we may wear an imperishable wreath, an imperishable Stephanos, to win an ultimate victory. But what's amazing, it is just it is just as wrong to think that I can win an athletic event without putting in the work as to think I can win the crown of life and not put in work. Those two things you can see are obviously inconsistent. And that's what he's calling them to as he's showing them a greater crown of eternal life. So he says this. Now let me talk to you and let me show you what I do and the first thing he says is he talks about focus. And he says, so I do not run aimlessly, and I do not box as one beating the air. So he doesn't run, first of all, the running image, he does not run aimlessly. <clears throat> that is, he doesn't get out and start running and go, where's the finish line? 
where's the finish line? You know, where am I supposed to be running? How many laps is this race again? If you've made it to this point, you know exactly how many laps there are. You know exactly where the finish line is going to be, which they were all marked, even though they would cut many laps around the particular stadium. And he says, when I run, I run with one intention. The same way a runner runs with one intention. I know exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. And then he uses the boxing metaphor. And he says, I do not punch, I do not <clears throat> box as one beating the air. Now, there are two schools uh, of interpretation about how to take this text. Some people think he's talking about shadow boxing, the preparation and the warm-up. I don't think that's what he's talking about at all. I think what he means is, when I throw a punch, I intend to land it. I don't box as one who beats the air. I'm not wasting punches in the air. When I throw one, I intend to hit the opponent. And boxing was a very serious sport to them. And it wasn't nice, fancy, soft gloves that, we care, that boxers use today. It was lead balls wrapped in leather around the knuckles. And so what he's saying is, I have a focus. When I'm running, I know exactly what point, how many laps and where I'm running to. When I hit, I know exactly where I'm hitting. I know exactly the fact that I want to land this punch at this particular location for a reason to weaken them in this point. I know exactly what every blow is intended to do. Now, what is his point? In Christianity, I'm focused. Paul wasn't a boxer. But spiritually speaking, he was. I know exactly what it is that I'm trying to do. I know the goal for which I'm running. I know what every blow is intended to do. What I do, I do for a reason. Now, one of the most important principles that we have to learn in general toward life is this. Never, ever confuse busyness with accomplishment. There are people who are busy but accomplish nothing. Busyness, and sometimes... You know, we look at it and say, but I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy. Well, what are you accomplishing? Well, I don't. well, then what are you doing? What are you doing? Never confuse busyness with accomplishment. If I'm going to invest my time, which God only gives me so much, if I'm going to take that God-given investment and put it into something, I need to at least be able to explain why I put my time into it. And so to have the focus of knowing what is going on, and what it is that I'm about. And in Hebrews chapter 12, as you're running, he says in verse 2, looking to Jesus, and the word literally means to look away from everything else and to focus solely on Jesus. I know exactly why I'm running this race, because my eyes are focused on the one who's waiting for me at the finish line. And nothing else, no crowd member, no other competitor, nothing else removes my focus from Jesus. Paul said, that's how I run my life. I'm focused. Jesus stays at the center all the time. Next, he gives the principle again of discipline. And he uses very vivid imagery. He says, but I discipline my body and keep it under control. Now, the word translated discipline in the ESV is actually a term uh, that's two words put together, and it literally means to hit under the eye. It's a boxing term. It means to hit under the eye and carries with it the idea of, of bruising, of black and blue. And so the point is, I discipline my body, I box, I punch. He's not talking about literally punishing his body, okay? He's talking about exercising self-control. I discipline my body... And I keep it under control. Literally, I bring it into slavery. I bring it into slavery. And in the New Testament, there are a couple of passages that talk to us about the importance of when we were in the world, we followed our passions and our lust. Whatever we wanted to do, whatever felt good, that's what we did. But now that we have come to know Christ, we say no to those passions. We learn, we're actually able to say no just... I don't do it just because I can't. And so his point is, 
that he has to take control of his body. His body doesn't take control of him. Okay? We don't let how we feel dictate what we do. Now, how many people have honestly woken up on a Sunday morning and you were dog tired? Probably all of us multiple times. A lot. Now, I've got a choice to make in that moment. Right? I can either listen to my body, which says, go back to sleep and rest, or... I cannot let my body control me and I can control my body and say, I don't care how you feel, we're getting up and we're going. That's discipline. Why is, it, why is it that so many people understand that when it comes to playing a sport but not when it comes to serving Jesus? So what, I'm tired. Can you imagine going to your trainer for the Olympics and saying, I didn't show up today because I was tired. I mean, surely I'm not crazy for thinking that, right? That's what Paul is saying. Now, it's a battle. Obviously, it must be a battle if he's having to beat his body, the imagery, the metaphor, and he's having to keep his body under control. There must be a battle going on. He must be feeling drawn to certain things, but he's exercising control over them. Keeping those desires. And he says, because... Here's the danger. Lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Now this word translated preaching was a word that was also used to describe the individual in control of the games who would call the, game, the next game to order, who would, who would read aloud the rules for everyone to see and for everyone to hear and to know. And so he says, when I have preached to others, I have put the rules in front of other people and then the image is that that individual who put those rules in front of other people competes in his own athletic event and he is disqualified for cheating. Because at the end, when the victor won, he would be inspected by judges to make sure that he had not cheated in any way. And so Paul is saying, lest I have to practice self-control, lest when I have told other people what the rules are and how you're supposed to behave, I go over here and get disqualified for not playing according to the rules. What's his point? Paul is saying, I still have to exercise this as well. He's not saying, I'm above the rules. The same rules, Corinthians, that I'm telling you to live by are the same rules I have to live by. And you know what? If I decide not to live by the rules, God will disqualify me the same way he'll disqualify anybody else. You see, some people, because of their theological underpinnings, really struggle with this. And they say, well, Paul was talking about that his God would take his ministry away from him. Absolutely not. This is not a discussion of his ministry. This is a discussion of why are we doing it? They do it for a perishable crown and we do it for an imperishable. This is a discussion of the crown of life. This is a discussion of the salvation of the soul. And he said, even if I don't compete by the rules, God will disqualify me as well. Now let's move quickly to three small points of application. <clears throat> Number one, the discipline that is necessary in following Christ. We have to be careful and cautious and make sure that we're following Jesus carefully. And that we're doing it with endurance. That's what the, the imagery in Hebrews 12, where we look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. It doesn't say he enjoyed it, it says he endured it. And he then turns to the, right, to, the, to the readers of this letter and says, you need to emulate that example. You need to follow the same example of endurance. And if we're able to endure, to remain underneath it, that is, we don't in the middle of it, 
in the middle of the run say, I quit. If we remain underneath it, then we stand as victors, which the key verse for this entire VBS is 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4. When he says this, <clears throat> For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Now the word translated victory. Anybody have Nike shoes on tonight or a Nike shirt on? Okay, I figured Porter would. There's Braxton, he's got him, okay. What does that Nike swoosh mean? Where does it come from? Nike was the Greek goddess of victory. The word translated victory in the New Testament is N-I-K-E. It's Nike. Phil Knight, in his memoir, Shoe Dog, says he cannot remember exactly why they chose the swoosh. He said it's one of two reasons. He said it's either the sound that a person makes as they're running past you, or when he was younger, before he started Nike as a company, he went on a tour of Europe and all these different places, and he went in the temple of Nike, and that swoosh is actually one of her wings. And he says he cannot remember. He's, he's pretty advanced in age now. And, and he can't remember exactly what it was, why he chose that. But it's one of those two scenarios. And so, <clears throat> when he says this is the victory that overcomes the world, this is, this is the mark. This is, this is how Nike prevails. It's faith. So in following Christ... If we endure, we stand as victors. As Paul would say then in 2 Timothy 4, after having said that he had fought a good fight, he had finished the race, he had kept the faith, henceforth there is laid it for me a crown, a stephanos, same word, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. The victor's crown is awaiting. The second point of application is this. <clears throat> the shadow and the glory found in Christ. I need to make something very clear because sometimes when I talk about sports and its relation to faith, people can take the wrong thing away that somehow I'm anti-sports. That's not it. And that's never been it. Sports are amoral. What does that mean? It means they're neither good nor bad. It's how they're used. I'm not anti-sports at all. I'm actually a pro-sport individual. But I believe that sports are <clears throat> something. Tony Reinke has really distinguished himself in the last 10 years as an individual helping people understand the relationship of spectacles. That is the way we view the world. And he wrote this small book called Competing Spectacles in which he talks about some of, this, some of these issues, the relationship of faith and sports, which is always from the very first century all the way even to now, it has always been debated amongst Christians how it should be handled. And the point that he makes, he says, as I write this book, I'm sitting at the X Games with my son. And he says, I'm captivated. I'm captivated at what they're able to do. There are giant screens everywhere that show highlights of what they're able to do, that show us all of the information that you're introduced to the individual. And he says, but here's the thing. When a sport captivates me, he said, there's nothing inherently wrong with being captivated by it. And he's right. He said, but sometimes we stop there and we settle for that. When I am captivated by something, it's telling me something about myself. God has created me to be captivated. 
He's created us to be captivated. He even says in his writing that if you can watch certain things in the world and not be captivated, you're not superhuman, you're unhuman. Sports and the thrill for victory and triumph and all of those things show that there's something deeply embedded in us by our Creator. That this sport is just a small, dim shadow of who Christ really is. And that what happens is we take the shadow and we embrace it and we make it the ultimate thing. When it was really meant to be a pointer to something greater. C.S. Lewis, in some of his writings, describes how he would go out into his <clears throat> he would go out into his um, shed in the mornings to pray, and sometimes a, a, a sunbeam would would sneak through the slats in that shed. He said, "So it's all dark, and then you see this sunbeam kind of like landing right between your feet, and so you follow it all the way up to see the crack in your in your shed." He said, "That's the way we're to experience glory." When the light of something shines in, it's right to enjoy that light. But if you stop at simply the light that's in front of you, you've missed the point. Because the light that is in front of you, if you trace that sunbeam up to the top of that shed and then go outside and you trace that sunbeam even further, where are you going to land? The sun. When there are things that captivate us, we're supposed to trace those things out and say, if this captivates, surely there must be something greater that's driving and that should captivate us even more. And that is the source of the sunbeam. The sport is just a sunbeam. Enjoy it, live in it, but don't ever forget that it's a smaller glory compared to the greater glory found in Christ. That's the spectacle that's meant to capture our hearts. And all the others are simply to be enjoyed in their proper place. And that's Colossians 3, 1 through 4. To set our mind on things above and not on the things of the earth. And so this week, in VBS, we look at spiritual Olympi Olympics being champions, about teamwork, and selflessness and devotion and leadership and faith. So that when the ultimate game of life is over, we stand as victors. That's the whole point. So the question for us tonight from 1 Corinthians 9 is, are we running the race? Are we even in the race? Because you can't stand as a victor if you didn't qualify if you didn't fill out the paperwork in order to start the race, you won't be able to stand as a victor. And so if a person desires to get into the race with a penitent faith, confessing Jesus to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of their sins, they begin their race. Or maybe as New Testament Christians, we have not been striving, we haven't been exercising self-control and discipline in running after Jesus. That's the person to whom we are running. If we can help one another, that's what we want to do as we stand and sing this song.